Okay. Um, our presentation, my presentation uh, overview here. Uh, we're going to begin talking about the hardwood resource across the South. It's a very diverse resource. Um, we certainly can't cover every hardwood uh, forest type across the Southeast in one presentation, but uh, we'll we'll uh, definitely uh, 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 talk about those from a, from a broad sense. Uh, I want to hit on some factors that impact for, uh, hardwood management. Uh, there, there are several factors that can impact your ability to properly manage your hardwood forest, and I certainly want to hit on those. One of the, the real key concepts I, I want everyone to leave with tonight is the idea of conducting a hardwood stand evaluation. So what I want to have ha occur is, is when you leave, I want you to be able to walk into your woodland in your region and ask a series of questions about your stand to help you better uh, understand what you have um, and to help you make a decision on what direction your management needs to go in a hardwood stand. That can be a very difficult question for even experienced hardwood foresters. Another uh, uh, set of, of uh, tools I want to give you, uh, I have uh, throughout the presentation, uh, some of these are websites, some of these are publications, but there's quite a few decision support tools, if you will, that can help you to make decisions in your hardwood stand. And so I want to share some of those with you as we move through. And uh, as, as I already stated, the plan is to look at the forest and not delve into the trees just yet. And so I really want to stand back and talk about how do you uh, evaluate, what, what components are involved with evaluating a hardwood stand and not necessarily get into the trees just yet. I, you know, the old saying, uh, we can't see the forest for the trees. And I want to make sure that that's not the case in, in this presentation. Okay. Also, anytime I give a hardwood presentation, I like to put things into perspective. And this is another area where hardwood management diverges from pine management. And that is the reasons why we manage our hardwood forest, the objectives we have for management. And that, that's one of the, the, the benefits also of managing for hardwoods is that we can do multi-objective multi management um, in our forest. And so we could manage for timber, we could manage for wildlife, recreation, aesthetics, uh, environmental quality. And I'll walk through these as we move through the presentation. Oftentimes, uh, wildlife is a, is a big objective in, in hardwood uh, forest, uh, but uh, timber is certainly going to be an important aspect regardless of your objective. All right. so to. Uh, give us a little more background here. I'm going to try to get my highlighter going. And we get a little thing, hand out here. Uh, this obviously is the southeastern United States, and there, there are many different hardwood regions throughout the southeast. And so we obviously are not going to have time to walk through each of those regions. Uh, what I want to point out here, if you look at the areas in light green, uh, going from the Car uh, Virginia's, through the Carolinas, westward through um, northern Arkansas. These are our upland hardwood regions across the south, uh, from the Appalachian Highlands to the Cumberland Plateau to the Ozarks. This is typically where our pure upland hardwood stands occur across the south. Um, another uh, item I want to point out is the light blue color. And you see this uh, throughout the coastal plain region here, which is the area in orange, which is primarily loblolly and shortleaf pine forest that David was talking about. But you see these stream zones that run through the coastal plain. And that's where a lot of our bottomland hardwood forests occur uh, in minor streams and rivers. And those are some of the most productive hardwood sites in the United States. And, and so they're really an important resource, but those are bottomland hardwood sites. And then, of course, the, the largest uh, bottomland hardwood region in the southeast is the lower Mississippi alluvial valley. And at one time, this entire area was in bottomland hardwoods. And of course, we converted that to agriculture uh, several hundred years ago. And, and we've been uh, spending the last uh, 80 or 90 years or so, or, or 50 years or so, reforesting some of this area. But at one time, uh, this was a really large uh, hardwood, uh, bottomland hardwood area. The other uh, Quickly, the other uh, aspect to the uh, resource, within the Piedmont and the Coastal Plain, we do have mixed hardwood 
and pine stands that are, are pine forest types that occur uh, in a mixed scenario. And there's some interest among landowners in working uh, with uh, this mixed stand components, a little bit lower intensity management, and you'll have uh, some pine and some hardwood uh, mixed together. And, and there's some interest in doing that type of management, uh, particularly here recently. Probably the biggest uh, point I want to make about this slide is that you notice over here in the legend, um, a lot of the, several of the hardwood forest types include the oak species. And so what I want to leave this slide with is that oak species are very important to us, uh, regardless of the region you're in, whether you're in bottomland hardwoods, upland hardwoods, mixed uh, pine uh, hardwood forest, the oak uh, species group are going to be a very important part or a very important species in your management. Uh, and another uh, 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 concept I want us to leave this slide with is the idea that these forests all across the south, for the most part, are what we call even-aged forests. And so oftentimes we'll walk into a hardwood forest and we'll see trees of stems of different sizes. We may have 18-inch stems, 20-inch stems, and then we also may have 6, 10, and 12-inch stems mixed within those. And, and it's easy to get the, the concept in our heads that these are uneven aged stands or that the, the smaller trees are younger than the older trees. And I'll talk about that some more a few slides as we move through, but that's really not the case in most scenarios. These, these stands developed as, and often in old ag fields, and so the trees all established at relatively the same time. And so you'll hear me refer to even age management. And, and it's a real key concept if you're going to properly manage hardwoods. Uh, there's some harvest methods uh, that uh, uh, take in, that have employed uh, the concept of removing some of the larger stems and leaving some of the smaller stems. And that's why we have Dr. Clatterbuck giving his talk in a few minutes about how to manage degraded hardwood stands. And so there's a real risk there in thinking that there's big age differences in the stands when there's really not. Okay, so continuing along those lines, why are oak species desirable for management? And there's been quite a bit of research actually looking at this. And the studies have shown the importance of oak species uh, to woodland value in multiple objectives, uh, whether you're talking about timber, wildlife, aesthetics, or environmental quality. Obviously, from a timber production standpoint, uh, we have high utilization. They're relatively fast growing compared to other species, compared to hickories and other hardwood species. They're relatively fast growing. They're certainly not as fast growing as the pine, uh, the pine species are, but they're relatively fast growing. And as everybody would, would agree, their oak species are certainly important to wildlife. Uh, several studies have indicated cyclical um, or positive correlations between animal populations and acorn production. And so they can be a very important resource for quite an array of wildlife. Aesthetics, I have landowners that I work with here in Arkansas, uh, that that's the reason that they come ask me questions about how to manage their hardwoods. They, they aren't necessarily that interested in the timber objective. They get some revenue out of the stands, that's great, but they want the stands to be aesthetically pleasing to them. And so that's a really important objective and a really important value that we get from a hardwood forest. And then obviously the water and air quality. These are long-lived species. They are large biological systems, so they sequester a lot of carbon, and they're going to store that carbon for a long period of time. Uh, they have large root systems to take up uh, excess nutrients from the soil. And so from a, just from a, 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 a host of, of values that we, we can really um, um, uh, obtain through, our, 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 through emphasizing oak management. I'll go ahead and introduce uh, over here on the right uh, some of the resources that I wanted to, to give you, and I, I believe these are also on the, the website that you can you can look at. Uh, Silvics of North America, Volume Two, and this is the hardwoods put out. This is a, a, a website uh, that's that's put in place by the USDA Forest Service, and this is a really great resource. It um, not only gives you information on the species, but it gives you information on the soils and and that this that each species grows on, which is really important in tying species. Uh, to the site quality in hardwood. It also gives you information on uh, damaging, in, uh, damaging agents such as insects and disease, just a lot of good information there. 
The Virginia Tech uh, Dendrology website is a great website to help you identify what species you're dealing, tree species you're dealing with in your stand. And there's also a smart app that goes uh, along with this uh, called VTree, which is a very good uh, app to, uh, to take a look at to help you with tree ID. Okay, not only are species important, but tree quality is also important. This is especially true from a timber management objective. As you can see, the tree on the right here, I believe this is a southern red oak. You don't see many knots. You don't see many defect, defects. You see a lot of clear wood um, and a good state straight stem. And so this would be a high quality, uh, healthy, vigorous tree that we would want to manage uh, for health and productivity in our forest. And on the right here is the oak species as well. But again, it doesn't have the quality. You see the knots, the dead limbs. You know, from, a, from an economic standpoint, there's a huge difference um, between um, the value of these two stems. And there's also a difference between the, the relative health of these stems and the ability to manage for forest health through time. Another factor we must consider is the volume or, or the products we're going to produce. And, and this is a, a really key uh point that I like to make here. Um, we manage these stands for a long period of time when we're managing hardwood stands. And uh, you know you could be managing for 50, 60, maybe 70 years or longer in some of these stands. Um, and the, the product that's going to, to, to give us the value uh, to make that that taking that time to manage these stands worthwhile is the is the to ultimately get to the saw timber product class. And you don't necessarily have to understand uh, the, the numbers that are going on here, but this is basically, and this is a, an Arkansas example, but basically the light colored bars represent the vol volume of round wood that was produced this, this given year, and the gold bars are the value, the, the relative stumpage values uh, of those products. And if you look at the volume to, or the value to volume uh, ratios here for saw timber, we have a, a very good value to volume ratio um, with veneer products or specialty products such as white oak stave logs, which there's a lot of interest in this right now, literally throughout the upland region across the south. We have a very high value to volume ratio, and so these are products, if we can grow these products, we're going to be way ahead of the game from a, a, a rate of return or an economic standpoint. But what I wanted to point out here is the pulpwood. If we look at the pulpwood, uh, the, the volume is much of harvested is much higher than our, than our value of that product. But it's still important to be able to harvest this. And in some areas, it can be very difficult to even harvest uh, pulpwood. But it's really important that we're able to remove this product from the forest, regardless of your objective, because we really want to see our trees moving into these larger saw timber size classes. And removal of the p smaller pulpwood size stems is how we get there uh, more quickly. And so I always like to point that out when we talk about hardwoods, we're really talking about saw timber management. Okay, I talked about the ability to move material. Um, how, how far are you away from a mill? That is a very important question you need to ask, particularly with hardwood pulpwood. Typically with saw timber size material, we're going to find somebody that can take that. But if, we, if we're trying to move pulpwood, there are some areas across the south that that can be a difficult task simply because of your distance from the mill. It's going to impact your ability to move material, and it's also going to impact the, the value, the stumpage value of that material, the price you receive when you conduct a sale. If you're 200 miles from the nearest hardwood pulp mill, uh, you're certainly not going to receive the same price as someone 50 miles from the mill. And so this is a res another resource I wanted to share with you, and this is the Primary Forest Products Network. And here's the link to this. And you can go on here to your particular area, and it will literally map out the mills. And you can go up here and, and select what species and product type and or mill type and the state, your, your local state. And you can get some information on how, how far am I from my nearest mill? How, you know, how much of a hindrance is this going to be to me? So really, another really great resource is available to us. Okay, so let's move into how we go about making a stand evaluation. So if you take a woods walk, what questions should you ask as you walk through your woodland to get an idea for what you currently have in your existing stand and what direction, get an idea for what direction your, your management needs to go? And as I've already pointed out, we are dealing with a large number of species. 
the, each of these species has specific site requirements to grow well and perform well, and there's different levels of stem quality and value within the species and between species. And so all of these really create a scenario where you usually you'll walk into a, far, a hardwood forest or a hardwood stand, and you'll see some trees that are in really good shape. You can say, oh, man, that's a, that's a nice tree. I can manage that tree through time with no problems at all. And then there's going to be another component in that stand of trees that are questionable. They may be of a questionable species that's not going to help you meet your management objective, or they may just be a, a tree that's had some damage or, or something that makes that tree uh, inferior in quality. And so you're, you typically are going to have some combination of those two things. And that can make the decision process very difficult as, as to whether I need to move forward with management or whether I need to think about a regeneration method. And the, the flow chart here on the right, I put together, uh, so I have an existing hardwood stand. I have an objective for that stand. I talked about that earlier, timber, wildlife, or what have you. Um, and then I'm going to conduct my stand evaluation based on that particular objective, or, or it may be multiple objectives in some scenarios. And, I'm, you know, hopefully you're going to work with a professional forester to do this, but there are some questions that you can ask and some, some methods you can do on your own to start getting these answers. And the, and the simple decision I'm going to make is should I continue to manage my current stand or do I need to go in the direction of regeneration? And if I, if I say I don't have enough material here to manage the stand through time, I need to look at natural regeneration or artificial regeneration. Whereas if I have a manageable stand, I can do intermediate operations such as thinning and, and uh, timber stand improvement. Species groups, so we can dive a little bit deeper into this. Desirability of hardwood species may differ based on specific management objective or the or landowner preferences. Some landowners prefer some species over others, and that's and that's fine. Um, some landowners are not interested in managing for game species if they're managing for wildlife. They're more interested in the non-game wildlife. So that could impact what you consider desirable species for your management. But as a general rule of thumb, again, the oaks are going to be very important to us and, and regardless of our management objective. Species like black walnut, if you have the proper site, it can do very well. And then we have some species that may or may not, depending on your local markets, may or may not be acceptable species. And then you'll hear us uh, talk about timber stand improvement in hardwoods. And a lot of times we're simply talking about improving our species composition and removing uh, the hickories, the red maple, the elms, and those types of things that oftentimes are unacceptable species to management. Now you see we have ash on here. And if if you've been around the forestry uh, community at all lately, you know that we have a critter here in the south, the emerald ash borer, that is really wreaking havoc on the ash species across the south. And so where historically this has been a desirable species for management, we really have to ask ourselves, is ash a desirable species any longer? because of the threats from the emerald ash borer. And so if I have a forest that has a large component of a tree like this that could be susceptible, uh, I need to ask myself, is this a species I need to be managing for through time? Okay, also uh, kind of taking a step back to that initial slide, uh, setting my objectives, and, and we need to do that first off by identifying where we are. And I, and I talked about that in the map earlier. You know, I couldn't go into all the different forest types across the southeast. There's so many of them. But if you can identify whether you're in a bottomland, a terrace, or an upland, and, you know, a bottomland is going to be the active floodplain, so you have a stream nearby and the site floods on occasion or floods often. The terrace is going to be an old floodplain, so it doesn't flood any longer. It used to be the, the stream bank, and it's no longer the stream has moved away. And so those are, are sites kind of in between the upland and the bottomland regions. Or am I on an upland site? And typically our upland sites are not going to be quite as productive as our bottomland sites. Not all upland sites are going to be sites that can produce the quality saw timber that we want to, to, to provide. Uh, so, so that's something I have to take into consideration. Again, desired species. What species are going to help me achieve my goals? And then my desired product goals. These are all things that, are, that I have to ask myself. Uh, and ultimately I have to ask, particularly if I'm in a non-timber objective, how much investment can I afford? And time and money are very important to us. But ultimately, what final product is it? What value or, or what final product am I wanting to, to obtain from my forest? And that's, that's what we're trying to get at. 
Okay, so we want to analyze our current conditions. You know, have a have a timber timber inventory conducted by a professional forester. Uh, develop a stand table that gives you the species breakdown, that gives you the size breakdown um, in the stand, and tells you the the tons per acre that you have in the stand to give you some some numbers to help you understand what you're dealing with in your forest, in your hardwood forest. If if wildlife is an objective, uh, you know, I may want to do some some numbers evaluations. Uh, uh, evaluate my habitat, and one of the big things, now we're not getting into wildlife management too much tonight, one of the big things with uh, saying, okay, I'm going to manage for deer or some other game species, if I only have or if you only have uh, 40 acres or 50 acres that you're going to be managing and you say I'm going to be managing for deer, well, it's going to be very important to understand what, uh, understand what your uh, neighbor's uh, land Around you, what type of habitat do they have? Is, there, is, is, is their condition on their property going to help you uh, with, with your management? Because obviously, the size of your tract could really imp uh, have an impact on that. And I always have to come back to this species site considerations. Um, as we move into, let's say you're in a bottomland hardwood forest. Okay, once you get into that that area. Even even slight differences in elevation can completely change the species sweep that you're managing for, or the species sweep that can grow well on that site. And so, understanding what species, tree species are going to perform well on your site is an extremely important step uh, before you you set any objectives. And so, after we get this information, it may be important to us uh, to come back and and revisit our objectives and make sure they're realistic for our scenario or our situation. Okay, back to the concept of, of stand age and even age forest. Um, there's really two fallacies about tree size and age. The, that is that large trees equal old trees and small trees equal young trees. For the most part, hardwood stands across the southeast are even age. And so, as I've stated before, if you see a, a, a tree that is 20, 22 inches and then there's a, another hardwood tree near it, uh, whether it's the same species or a different species that, that's 12 or 14 inches, those trees are probably very close in age. It's just that that larger tree got a, a better competitive position at some point in time uh, earlier in the stand development phase. And it's a, that's a really important concept. And so in an even age stand, you can see here on the right uh, the, the, uh, stand, the uh, hardwood stand development timeline. And so in the first 10 years where the stand's pretty much going to establish itself, and then basically on a long period of time of stand, of stand growth and stem exclusion. And then at some point, 60, 70, 80 years out into the future, the stand's going to mature and we're going to want to regenerate that stand. It's an even age stand. We're going to want to use a regeneration harvest to start that stand over. And I'm going to come back to this in a, in a, in a moment. Tree vigor, this is another important uh, question you need to ask as you look at your forest when you're conducting an evaluation. Um, we want to manage, obviously, for high vigor trees. They're better quality, they're more disease and insect resist, they provide more disease and insect resistance. They're going to help assist us in managing for forest health, overall quality uh, in our forest health. The components of tree vigor, what do I need to be looking for as I walk through the forest, my woodland? Uh, a full crown. Signs of limb dieback or decay, those are all, all red flags if we start to see those about the condition of a tree. And then the con condition of the tree bowl itself. Uh, is there any signs of damage or decay? And we, and we really have to uh, take that into consideration with the, with the concept of how far into the future can I feel comfortable managing this particular tree. Okay, I'm certainly not going to have time to get into log grade tonight. That's we could spend an entire evening or a day or a couple of days uh, learning how to grade logs or hardwood logs. But it's really a really important step to get an idea for the stem quality in your stand. It helps us determine merchantability, the types of products we can produce. Um, it also helps us determine the, the, the economic value. Uh, and we can use that when we're marking the stand for thinning. And of course, the base concept would be to remove the lower grade trees and leave our higher grade or better trees. That's not often or not always what occurs when we do a thinning in a hardwood stand, though. Okay. Uh, I like to show this because ultimately you're going to say, okay, 
I have an idea for the species I have in my stand. I have an idea for the quality of those trees. Now, how many of those do I need? And this is a stocking table, and I certainly don't expect everyone to uh, be able to understand everything that's going on here. But basically, we have an understock level, a fully stocked level, and an overstock level. And so the overstock level would represent a stand that is in need of thinning. It has too many trees per acre for the size of the stem. You see average DBH in trees per acre here. So it has too many stems per acre for the size of the trees that are on the site. So we need to thin that back typically to the fully stocked level here. So this fully stocked level is the ideal level. This is where we want to be from a timber production standpoint. We're going to be in really good shape if we're here. The way I like to use this uh, understock level as kind of like the minimum number of trees I need to consider my stand manageable, particularly from a timber objective. And a real uh, useful rule of thumb that I've used for years is if I have an average diameter of 12 inches to 14 inches, so if you're talking about small saw, tem saw timber sized stems, um, I need about 50 or 55 of those per acre to have a good uh, uh, stand that I can manage into the future. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb. If you have that small saw timber size tree, if you have you know 50 or so of those per acre in pretty good shape, then you can manage that stand. If you're below that, uh, then we get into Dr. Clatterbuck's talk about what do I do with a degraded stand um, and do I need to think about regenerating that stand in some in some way. One of the, I, one of the key points I also need to point out you know, like in pine management, I may be just concerned with my stocking. How many trees do I have and what size are they? Well, in hardwoods, it's even more important to have a feel for the number of manageable trees per acre I have. How many trees are of the desirable or acceptable species and of the quality to help me reach my objectives? And so, yeah, I need 50 or 55 12-inch trees, but I also need them to be manageable trees and not inferior trees. Okay, so ultimately, uh, to start wrapping things up here, uh, the ultimate goal of a stand evaluation is simply to categorize trees as manageable or unmanageable, and I'll throw another class in here, cull trees. Uh, manageable trees are simply the trees that will help me meet my landowner objectives, you know, the objectives I have for my woodland. The unmanageable trees, they may be an undesirable species. Um, it may be a tree that I'm worried about degrading or experiencing mortality in the next 10 years, and so a tree like that may fall into the unmanageable class. It's just not going to help me meet my goals. Cull trees, they may be of a desirable species, but they don't meet our other requirements for management, and so they still may be useful to us as a seed source, of a food source, or den trees, or that type of thing. They're just not going to help us meet our, our management goals overall. Um, and so over here on the right, see I have manage and regenerate. And so the ultimate decision I'm going to make, let's say I have a stand that's 33 years old, and I say, yeah, I've, I've looked at my stand. I've had a forester work with me. We have a pretty good stand we can manage into the future. And so that means I can manage that stand for another 10 years, and then I need to conduct this evaluation again. Um, hardwood stands can really change over 10-year periods. I've seen trees that had a very high grade when we evaluated the stand, I've seen them deteriorate within 10 years and not be as high a grade 10 years later as they were when we first conducted our evaluation. And so you'll see this 10-year cutting cycle. But in this managed realm, we're going to, to utilize uh, improvement thinnings or timber stand improvement where we're going to improve species composition. So we're going to manage that stand into the future, if you will. Uh, if I make a decision to regenerate, I just don't have the material here to manage the stand into the future. Uh, these are even age forest again, and so I need to think about a regeneration method for that stand. Okay, so in, in summary, uh, establish your objectives. What is it that you want to, to, to accomplish through your management? Also, these are long-lived forests. These are going to take a long time to grow, and so think about forest legacy and getting a management plan in place um, so that, so that there's something in place for generations to manage these forests because that we do manage them 50, 60, 70 years or longer in some instances. Analyze your current conditions. Make decisions to keep your costs low, particularly if you're not in the timber objective. Uh, the cost of the operations can be really important. Develop a schedule of activities. And then I always uh, end with uh, seek professional help. These, these are difficult decisions 
Uh, it, oftentimes it may see, seem simple, and then when you get into the, the hardwood stand, uh, it becomes much more difficult to make these decisions. So seek professional help. And these are some resources you can, can go to to get help, uh, uh, your county extension office, forestry commission. But private consultants that have a hardwood management experience, have hardwood management experience, can be invaluable to you to make these decisions. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with uh, some decision support tools. Uh, pretty much this presentation is pretty much written out in this fact sheet, evaluating the managed potential. Is, uh, it says of upland hardwood. This is one I wrote for Arkansas. But the concepts in here really apply. Many of the concepts in here really apply to bottomlands as well. Uh, so I take a look at that, and, and you can review some of the things we covered in this presentation. The Tree ID web, uh, websites and apps. There's a soils. There's there's a soils uh, support tools online. If you're going to plant hardwoods uh, in an old field, a lot of times it's really good to go to this, the soils website. It's put out by the USGS. Uh, it's called the WGS Soils Mapper. Uh, and you can you can look at the soil types on your property online before you ever even step so, uh, foot on the field, and that can be really invaluable to you and save you a lot of problems with sur survival and planting. Uh, mapping, uh, landowners can do a lot of their own mapping now to get an idea of where my hardwood woodland occurs on my property, uh, and that's through Google Earth. There's, uh, there's a lot of utility in Google Earth these days. And then timber price reports. Pretty much every state has a timber price report now. I know we do one here in Arkansas, and then there's also regional sources for those. 